the um, the politician Henry Clay of Kentucky. Uh, Clay has an idea about how uh, American uh, American politics and the American economy should work together. It's not terribly different from Alexander Hamilton's so kind of a takeoff on that idea, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's very controversial. So we'll look at that, and then we'll look at the opposition to Clay's idea, uh, especially in the person of Andrew Jackson, um, president and uh, um, the founder, really, of the Democratic Party, as, as we understand the Democratic Party, and the hero to uh, the common man, uh, small-time guys in uh, the countryside or in the city as well, in many cases. Uh, so we'll look at Jackson's uh, career a little bit. Then I want to talk about one of the biggest issues of the 1830s uh, and really what the presidential contest in 1832 um, revolves around, and that is um, the Bank of the United States, which Andrew, um, sorry, uh, Alexander Hamilton had founded, and is still around um, in 1832. And it's uh, a very, very big deal. Um, and then I want to look at uh, the question of fear in the market, something that I've, I've alluded to before, uh, but I want to look at that a little more, a um, little more clearly. All right, the themes today: uh, one is that the market revolution had multiple dimensions that transformed American life. Um, and uh, we'll look at that a little more. And then secondly, the politics of the period were dominated, or was dominated, by basic disagreements about the market economy. And really that drives politics. Well, what do you think of the market revolution? It's going to determine which political party you're in. So now let's begin by looking at textiles and the textile revolution. All right, so we're going to be looking at the market revolution a little bit more, and we're going to be looking at it beyond agriculture, because really the market revolution beyond agriculture is the more important aspect of the market revolution, the development of industry in the United States. And we can trace the roots of that to the 1820s. I'm of the school that really don't believe you can talk about an industrial co economy in the United States before uh, the 1850s to any great extent, but uh, certainly the roots of it go back farther, um, and that's to the 1820s and to the textile revolution. So let's look at that. Uh, here is a before picture. This is what American manufacturing looks like um, before this vast transition that takes place in the uh, 18, beginning in the 1820s and the decades after. Um, and this is a type of uh, industrialization, uh, if you really want to use that word, that uh, exists in the United States um, for the most part before the 1850s. Uh, what do we see here? We see very small mills. These are uh, mills in Brandywine, Pennsylvania. Um, they are uh, uh, very limited in size. They have limited markets. They tend to be owned by... Um, small uh, either families or, or groups of investors um, and they um, are confined to water power for their their products what the inside of one of these mills looks like actually one of the bigger ones uh, still uh, pretty simple um, those uh, machines would uh, be powered by water um, and uh, they'd largely manufacture for a local market okay that's the before now let's look at the textile revolution, the after. This is what Lowell, Massachusetts looks like in 1839. And Lowell's a very interesting and important place because it's the first of uh, the true industrial centers in America. And really, it's a place built as an industrial town. Lowell, Massachusetts in 1817, there's nothing there. This uh, It's just a big bend in the Merrimack River. Um, but... Uh, Lowell uh, is created deliberately as an industrial um, town, and it grows into a major industrial center like you see here. It's founded uh, right um, after the War of 1812, uh, 
and the person who gets the idea for it is named Francis Cabot Lowell. And Francis Cabot Lowell happens to be in Britain when the War of 1812 breaks out, and he's from a Boston um, commercial family, uh, and they are looking for a way to diversify, uh, and the War of 1812 really pushes that agenda, and here's why. The British Navy blockades Boston during the War of 1812, and these traders, these trading families who, you know, uh, uh, trade goods with China, for example, uh, they're out of business for the duration of the war, so what are they going to do uh, to make money? The second thing is, is that the war represents an opportunity because all manufactured textiles are being imported into the United States before the war. That's obviously cut off by the war. And this represents the chance to build up in a domestic textile industry. Domestic textile industry couldn't compete before the War of 1812. They'd, they'd be hopelessly outproduced and undercut in price by um, British manufacturing centers. So what Lowell says is, hey, this is a way to invest my family's money and a way to do something that we couldn't do before, make textiles at home. And they use stolen British technology. When, in fact, Lowell had been scouting around in British cotton mills when the war broke out because he's trying to figure out how much of this technology uh, you can steal and use back in the United States. So um, they copy the British uh, textile system uh, and they bring it to America. They pick uh, this bend in the Merrimack River where there's lots and lots of water power um, and they begin to build this manufacturing center and it's wildly successful uh, about the time it's about its peak is probably about the time this picture is made in 1839, 1840 or so um, after that uh, things begin to, in fact, it's probably past its peak in 1839 because the depression's come on. Um, but uh, after that, things tend to get worse. But this, there's a 20-year period where Lowell is wildly successful and um, uh, it really begins manufacturing in America. And this is what the inside of the more modern cotton mills of the 18... 30s uh, and after look like. Um, still powered by water for the most part, but uh, look how many more machines there are. Look how the machines are now, um, instead of uh, basically wooden looms on wooden frames, they're much more industrialized. Uh, they're metal. Uh, they're mass produced. Um, they are cranking out a lot more product, uh, a lot more people working there. This is the direction in which industry is headed in the 1830s. Here's a map of cotton mills um, in uh, the 1820s and uh, we're interested in towns with a thousand or more cotton mill employees, the bigger redder dots, just a handful. Uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island and um, uh, uh, Fall River, Massachusetts and there's Lowell right in the middle, a couple of others. Um, it's manufacturing in the 1820s is still on a very um, small scale. And when it says towns with 500 uh, to 999 cotton mill employees, that doesn't mean they're all working at the same place. Uh, in most cases, in fact, I think all cases except Lowell in the 1820s, uh, they're probably spread uh, through a variety of different, um, different mills. So, point is, Industrialization in the 1820s is very small, very low scale. Lowell's really the only place that we would recognize as industrialized today. And uh, the textile industry is the first industry to be industrialized. Um, something that we're going to talk about later in the semester, we're not going to talk about any more today, is that all of these cotton mills are being powered by southern cotton. Um, and the rise of the cotton economy in the South most of them, most of which, um, they're most of what they're growing, they're selling to Britain, but some of it's headed north. That is intimately tied to the growth of uh, this textile and uh, manufacturing economy in the Northeast. And of course, the more cotton you're growing across this vast area of the South, we can see here comparison between 1820 and 1840. 
the more cotton you're growing, uh, the more slaves you need to grow it. So the the growth of slavery is tied to this industrialization in the textile industry, and when we we'll get back to that when we talk about slavery later in the semester. All right. So if textiles are the leading edge of industrialization, it doesn't stay that way terribly long. Uh, and the next couple of slides are um, just little indications of how the economy is beginning to change in the first half of the 19th century. So we have this photograph of the peddler, uh, and we've got the caption here that peddlers are pioneers of the market revolution because they carry samples. Um, and uh, not just samples, but once you make an order, they'll carry the good to you. Um, they are the distribution system. Very, very primitive uh, kind of uh, uh, hand distribution system. Um, but uh, they are the ones bringing the market revolution, the goods produced in the market revolution, into remote areas, uh, into areas like, you know, the Ohio frontier, uh, or what used to be the Ohio frontier, and now is rapidly becoming middle America in the 1830s and 40s. Um, and this is a slide of a tinsmith. Um, and this is the sort of person the Industrial Revolution is putting out of business. This guy hand makes, looks like coffee pots, out of tin. Um, and you can see his tin shears, his, those oversized uh, scissors looking things, a couple of his hammers, um, shaping tools. Um, this guy is an artisan. He hand makes uh, uh, these tin products. Uh, today, you know, if you want a coffee pot, you go to a department store, you go online, and you order one that's made in some enormous factory someplace. Um, and uh, the idea that you're going to have a handmade coffee pot is, uh, it's a real luxury item today. There's probably still, I mean, I know you can get hand-thrown coffee pots of ceramic ones uh, from potters in places like Vermont. Who knows, maybe there's some guy hand-making coffee pots out of tin someplace. Um, but if there is... Uh, he or she is selling high-end status symbols, you know, that people in Manhattan say, look at my handmade coffee pot, it cost me $500. Um, th his, this type of job has really, uh, for the most part, been completely put out of business by the Industrial Revolution. So that's the kind of disappearing, um, disappearing craft that uh, is going to be uh, subsumed by the Industrial Revolution. All right, the next couple of slides are my example of how this changes. And I'm talking about shoemaking. So here's the before picture. Uh, shoes used to be made by cobblers. Uh, and you can find cobblers uh, for a very long time. There was a cobbler working in Rutland, Vermont, until about six or seven years ago. And he um, uh, would fix shoes, but uh, the original cobblers would make shoes. And it's a very, very skilled craft. You had to be able to cut and sew leather, and you had to be able to shape it. Uh, so here is the cobbler and his assistant at work, and we see all these different shapes and um, uh, sewing tools and hammers and you know all the stuff you need to hand make tools. Well, as it turns out, the manufacturing of shoes is one of the very earliest industries to be industrialized. So here's the, there's a before picture. Let's say we can place that guy in, say, 1820. Um, yeah, that's about right. Um, and here's what we've got by 1880. Um, uh, a shoe manufacturing, Massachusetts in particular, uh, becomes known for shoe manufacturing. Uh, Brockton, Massachusetts is a shoe town, for example. This place happens to be in Webster, Massachusetts. So Humphrey and Burnham Shoe Manufactory, uh, we just say factory today, um, and uh, it does in 1876 an annual business of $130,000 employing 125 workers. So um, that's what happens in the shoe industry. And shoes and textiles are just you know two examples of this uh, process of industrialization that begins to take over in more and more and more industries. Until by the 1850s you can say that industrialization really is um, a big ongoing shift in um, the American economy. And here's our local example in Burlington again. I showed you the slide last lecture of the carriage factory in Burlington and the founder of it who started life as, a, as an artisan and ends life as a manufacturer. All right, 
tie in with the market and transportation revolutions is the growth in population in America. So let's take a look at some of that. Uh, these are going to go through these maps very quickly because you've seen them all before. Here's population density map in 1820 with yellow and red and green being the highest density places. You know, obviously that, that darker blue is uh, uh, very low, uh, thinly populated. And here's the population in 1860 and you can see that it's spread west of the Mississippi and um, throughout the Northeast is now quite heavily populated with the exceptions of northern Maine, northern Michigan, and northern Wisconsin. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, great growth in population during these decades. And here's uh, two charts of cities. New York is the only one over 100,000 um, as of 1820. And in 1860, New York's um, over 500,000. Uh, Philadelphia is two. Brooklyn is um, over a quarter million. Boston, Chicago, um, are uh, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and New Orleans are all over 100,000. Oh, and Baltimore as well, all over 100,000. So these are just indications of this, this um, vastly increase, increasing American population uh, during the 19th century. All right, so we have the rise of manufacturing, or the beginnings of manufacturing. We have this vast population growth. We have the transportation revolution. All of these things are taking part by the 1820s. And uh, politics responds to that. So let's look at how politicians respond to that. We're going to look at Henry Clay, um, who is for a long time, very long time, uh, a leading participant in the debate about the market revolution. Henry Clay is arguably the most distinguished American politician who never becomes president. He tries, um, but he never quite makes it to the White House. Uh, nevertheless, he is a very, very important figure. He's the leader of his political party, the Whig Party. Um, he is the leading uh, political intellectual with uh, the notion of he's got a policy uh, proposal, um, and he's uh, he's a really important guy. Um, he uh, had been Speaker of the House, spent most of his career uh, during part of his life. He's most prominent as a U.S. Senator from Kentucky, but uh, very, very able and intelligent man. Anyway, here's Clay. He's from Kentucky, and as I just mentioned, um, he's in the House of Representatives during the War of 1812 as a, as a young guy. Um, and he, um, in the years uh, right after the war, um, comes up with a program for how he thinks uh, the American economy should proceed and what the government should do to um, help it uh, grow stronger and wealthier. So let's look at that. He comes up with something he calls the American system. Um, and what he's trying to do here is uh, some of the same things Hamilton was trying to do earlier. He's trying to promote American industry, um, and he wants a strong national bank. So here's his program. Uh, he wants a high tariff, a high tariff that or other, otherwise uh, tax on imported goods. And the tariff does two things. It raises the cost of imported goods, which therefore makes domestic um, products much more competitive, much more competitive than they would have been otherwise. And the other thing the tariff does is through taxing these imported goods, it raises money uh, that helps fund the government. And we'll get to what the government should do with that money in a minute. The second thing that Clay wants is a national bank. He thinks national banks are important institutions for fostering commerce. For the same reason the Merchants Bank, I told you last time, was important in Burlington, Vermont, a national bank is important nationally because it creates capital for investors, um, uh, and investors in big projects in the case of the national bank. So he thinks um, that would be a great aid to entrepreneurship and therefore to commerce in general. Uh, it would help... Uh, create a stable um, money supply as well, something we'll get to in a, in a little while. Uh, so national bank is a, a really good thing in Clay's view. And uh, 
he wants the government to uh, create one or sustain one. And then the third element of the American system is he wants to use that tariff money the government's been taking in and spend it on the transportation system. Uh, he wants subsidies, federal subsidies for roads and canals, which, you know, these things that are proven themselves, and other internal improvements. He'd like to aid railroads, dredging out harbors, uh, things like that, um, which will help uh, develop profitable markets for American agriculture and, 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 of course, stimulate the economy in other ways as well. So this is a program in which government and the banking system and private industry and the transportation system are all tied together. Uh, he's quite right to say all these things are tied together in in in, in economy, and uh, it's a way for government to continually invest in the American economy and to to make it uh, better. Uh, so here's some um, literature for uh, this is actually uh, not an 1824 campaign broadside for Adams. I mislabeled it. This is um, a campaign from. Um, probably from 1832, a literature for um, Henry Clay. Uh, so let's take a closer look at it. Here's um, the, um, the illustration that goes with it. And what do we see? We see a ship that represents trade. It's named after Adams. That's what got me confused in the first place. Um, and um, we got a little bit of an allusion to the War of 1812. Sailors' rights, no colonial subject, uh, subjection. Um, but free trade is the most important part. Trade is tied to manufacturing on the left and farming. We see uh, on the left we see the textile uh, loom with the operative there and farming on the right. So trade, industry, and agriculture, they as uh, grouped together, working in harmony, are the keys to. Ag, uh, in, uh, sorry, national prosperity. Uh, and it tells us here, national industry is national wealth, and agriculture is the source of prosperity. So all of those things together, he wants to foster in a complex, growing economy in America. And here's another illustration making the same point. Uh, Clay and the tariff, Clay's in support of the tariff, in support of high tariffs. And there's the happy sailor, um, nailing Henry Clay's uh, um, name up there on top of the mast and the American flag because Clay means uh, prosperity. So here's the body of uh, the same um, illustration. Uh, most of this is an attack on Andrew Jackson. Um, um, but Let's read the second paragraph. Uh, if the Jackson Party prevail, the Democrats, a majority of the next Congress will be opposed to the tariff, to mechanics, manufacturers, and domestic injure, injure, industry. Excuse me. As proofs of, of this, the Jackson Papers, in other words, the Jackson Political Platform, um, publish articles recommending the repeal of all laws that have been passed to encourage our mechanics and manufacturers. The consequences will be that the sound of the shuttle, that is, the, the loom, uh, the um, textile industry, in other words, will be no more heard. Our stores will be filled with British and Scottish um, textiles, ginghams, shirtings, checks, and bentics, uh, and not a place will be found for a yard of American cloth. So, um, if you are in favor of, of um, industry, if you're in favor of uh, if you're part of this new industrial economy, manufacturers and mechanics, he keeps referring to, um, you should be in favor of Henry Clay's system. Clay represents, you can see, uh, on behalf of the manufacturers. Now today we'll say, oh, that's much fat cat, uh, one percent of business owners, but um, the, it's got a different meaning in the 18 early 1830s. In other words, if you're in favor of industry, if you're in favor of this mixed economy, you should be in favor of Henry Clay. All right, Clay's great political opponent is Andrew Jackson, and he and Jackson take uh, opposing views on all of these issues. So let's hear from Andrew Jackson, there he is, and um, why he believes what he does. Well, uh, 
Jackson's a war hero. Jackson becomes famous after the War of 1812. He's the victor of the Battle of New Orleans. And he, in addition to being uh, a hero, is also a guy who's immensely appealing to many, many Americans um, of the period. Why? Well, Jackson is self-made. He was born into poverty. His father died in his infancy. His mother dies when he's 14. One of his older brothers had died. Uh, Jackson is uh, left alone as a, as a young teenager and has to make his own way in the world. He was born in a log cabin. He's our first president born in a log cabin. His parents were immigrants from Ireland. He's somebody who is uh, starts out at the bottom in American life and uh, makes it to the top. He becomes a very wealthy man. He owns a big plantation. He owns all his slaves. Um, uh, so he's a guy who, who makes it to the top, and he's a war hero. And finally, Jackson is a westerner he's somebody he, he leaves uh, the carolinas where he's from uh some argument about whether he's from north carolina or south carolina he spends most of his time in south carolina uh and then uh as a young man he heads west he heads through the appalachians and he goes to nashville tennessee where he spends uh, most of the rest of his life um so he, um, in the terms of the 1820s, is a Westerner. He's a self-made man. He's a farmer. Um, he's a war hero. Uh, and the combination of all of those things makes him an irresistibly strong candidate um, and the most popular politician of the 1820s and 1830s. Okay. Jackson happens to be from Tennessee, and as I mentioned, Henry Clay's from Kentucky. Um, and these guys uh, really dislike each other. Um, they disagree politically. Uh, they dislike each other personally. Um, uh, Jackson is famous for his temper and his stubbornness. Clay, on the other hand, is a guy who's born to, to maneuver in Washington. He's uh, the women love him. Uh, he gets along with everybody. He uh, plays poker with the boys. Um, he tells great jokes. He's a wonderful person to have at parties. He's suave. He's well-mannered. Um, uh, and uh, he knows how to build alliances. Jackson, uh, who's also, I shouldn't exaggerate this too much, Jackson was also known to be a Southern gentleman as well and obviously built quite an alliance. He wouldn't have been elected president. But Jackson uh, was much, um, much more uh, blunt and stubborn. Um, and he had a furious temper. Um, all right, when Jackson's elected president, there's a tremendous celebration from the Hicks. All of these backwoods when come to uh, Washington to celebrate, um, and uh, they swarm into the White House. In those days, after the inauguration, the president would would spend the rest of the day shaking hands with whoever wanted to shake his hand. So this is. Uh, enormous swarm. Nothing had been like this. You know, when John Quincy Adams had been elected in 1824, there, there aren't, you know, enormous crowds of people who go to the White House to shake his hand. This is something new. All of these hicks from the boondocks suddenly appear in Washington, uh, and nobody's seen anything like it. And Washington society is rather appalled by this. Uh, and this is what Jackson's enemies think of Jackson. Jackson says that he is um, represents the people at, at large. They say no. He considers himself a king. They call him King Andrew the First here. Uh, he's shredded the Constitution, which he's stomping on. Um, he's uh, overusing the veto. He, uh, Jackson's the first president to use the veto as a policy instrument and not as uh, an emergency measure. Um, uh, and um, uh, so his his enemies are quite thoroughly dislike him. This is a good example of that. Now Jackson's political coalition also begins to invent modern politics as we know it. They begin to do things like assemble tickets. That is a bunch of politicians running for office who are all pledged to the same policies. Um, now we. And that's obvious now, but, but they invented it. Um, they use um, nominating conventions. They um, begin to use publicity. They uh, 
refine the idea that goes back to Jefferson of newspapers writing editorials in support of a uh, political program. Um, they hold parades. They begin to campaign in a way to excite voters. and uh, uh, They use all these different tricks. And uh, the result is the invention of uh, modern politics. Um, Jackson's coalition becomes the Democratic Party. Uh, and the Democratic Party in the United States today is the oldest political party in the world, as astounding as that may be. Uh, but that goes back to the origins of modern democracy. Um, uh, so uh, Jackson assembles this very formidable coalition, and they're incredibly successful, and they take over American politics. Okay, now let's get back to the question of manufacturing. Jackson, as it says here, was ideologically opposed to virtually all aspects of Clay's American system. And um, let's actually go forward a slide and go back to that one. Uh, one of the issues in early in Jackson's presidency is a road bill. Now, the Ben Congress had agreed to build uh, what was called a national road, and Clay and people like Clay believed this would be kind of. Uh, the first uh, superhighway linking the west and the east. It would do for southern Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois what the Erie Canal and the Great Lakes did for northern Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. It would tie, uh, in other words, these western states to the east and facilitate trade and the movement of populations and uh, the development of local industry, all of these wonderful things if we build a road. So um, that's what um, uh, that's what this national road is supposed to be. National road is still there; it does get built, never gets farther than St. Louis. Um, but I've driven on it. I've gone from uh, Zanesville, Ohio, there uh, west to uh, Wheeling, Virginia, uh, on it before. Uh, this uh, I think it's Route 70 that closely parallels. In fact, you can. You know, it's probably within a quarter mile of the old National Road. But in any case, um, uh, it's there. And in 1830, um, Henry Clay, who's a big supporter of the National Road, wants to build a spur off of it into his native state of Kentucky. He wants to build um, a road that links um, uh, Maysville, Kentucky, and Zanesville, Ohio. You can see Zanesville there is on the eastern side of Ohio. Um, and it would link up uh, Lexington, Kentucky as well. Um, and uh, it's a private company building it, and he, Clay wants to support that company, so he, he puts this bill through Congress um, where the federal government will buy $150,000 in stock in this company to help build um, this road no. Uh, linking Kentucky and Ohio. Well, the first sign that the Jackson presidency is really going to be hostile to uh, the American system of Henry Clay is in uh, the Maysville Road Bill. Uh, Jackson vetoes it. Now, he doesn't like Clay personally. Uh, this uh, is a board that's going to benefit Clay's home state of Kentucky primarily. Uh, so he's got good political reasons to get rid of it, but Jackson also makes a case that the federal government shouldn't be in the business of building roads, and here's what he says, that this road's going to benefit the people of Kentucky and Ohio. Um, well, for Clay, that's that's enough. You know, the government should be in that business. Uh, uh, but Jackson says, look, why should people up in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Vermont pay or down in South Carolina and Georgia, why should they pay for a road that's going to benefit Kentucky and Ohio? That's unfair to them. You know, why should their tax dollars go to that? Uh, so uh, the, it's um, a case where the government is picking winners and losers, and where the government is benefiting some cronies um, at the expense of the uh, general public at large. So. Um, he vetoes the Maysville bill and the question of the government support of this American system of 
internal improvements of roads and canals, of um, uh, supporting manufacturing in general, whether that should be the case or not, that becomes the political issue of the 1830s. Jackson's Democratic Party coalesces around that question. Democrats don't believe that the government should be supporting these things. Um, the Whigs do, and that's that's the real distinction between those two parties. All right, let's have a little side trip into the nature of money now. Here's a, a Bank of the United States bill, big one, two thousand bucks, and shows you the scale of the Bank of the United States. This is not money you'd have in your pocket and go around spending. This is a bank note that's going to be held, prob most probably, by another bank. Um, in a nice big denomination to save space. Maybe, excuse me, but in the 1830s and 40s, I've mentioned this before very, very briefly, is almost entirely local. There's not um, much official U.S. dollars in circulation. And furthermore, there's no such thing as a dollar bill. The only official real money are coins gold and silver coins. Well, there aren't enough gold and silver coins in circulation for the economy to work. The money supply is just too small. So banks begin to issue these bank notes. And what a bank note is, is a promise to pay the holder of these notes in real dollars if you go into the bank and demand it. So I've got this $2,000 bank note. I'm going to go to the Bank of the United States and say, look, uh, I want cash hard on the Barrelhead, give me $2,000 in Liberty Dollars, and the Bank of the United States would do that. However, there are many more banknotes in circulation than there are dollars in the economy because most people don't need that cash on hand. They're not that uh, concerned with it. Pairing the note is much more convenient as long as you think the note is going to be actually redeemed and redeemable. That's the issue. So there are all sorts of local banks that also issue notes for local economies. And by local economies, I mean like towns. Um, uh, there aren't, isn't enough money in circulation in New Orleans, so this Canal Bank in New Orleans has this $10 bank note. Here's one for St. Joseph, Michigan, a dollar bank note from the Merchants Bank of St. Joseph. Here's one in uh, Jamaica, Vermont for uh, five bucks. Um, now, this bill isn't going to be worth five bucks very far from Jamaica, Vermont. You go down to New Jersey, say you try to spend this thing, people aren't going to take it. They've never heard of the West River Bank. And even if they had heard of it, if they wanted to go redeem this for five dollars in gold, uh, they'd have to go all the way up to Vermont to do it. So this thing isn't going to be worth very much. And finally, they'd be suspicious that, you know, this bank doesn't exist and that somebody just had a fancy printing press in their basement and was was making counterfeit bank notes. Um, so, oh, and then even if the bank does exist, they don't know how stable it is, whether it's going to be in business two years from now. So there are lots of reasons if you're somebody in New Jersey and, and you get handed this thing to be suspicious of it. And what that means is that these bank notes, for the most part, except for the most prominent banks, like the Bank of the United States and a few big city banks, these things are entirely local. Nobody's going to trust this West River Bank $5 bill or that St. Joseph, Michigan $1 bill 50 miles from where it was issued. Uh, and that has a very, very limiting effect on the economy. And even if they do decide to trust it, they're going to discount it heavily. So if you take this Vermont West River Bank banknote down to New York City, you may find a bank where they have business relation with the West River Bank and they know it's a good bank and so forth. But they're going to heavily discount the five dollar note. They're only going to give you in New York, New York to Vermont, probably two fifty for it. Um, the further away you go the more heavily discounted these things are, and you can't go very far where they're worthless, un until they're worthless. So the monetary system is very, very limited and very, very local, and that is an issue. And by the way, the United States, its government, isn't going to issue banknotes. Um, 
until the Civil War. They're called greenbacks, and that's why the uh, dollar bill you have in your wallet is green. Um, that's a, a, a U.S. banknote. Um, uh, let's skip this one uh, and get to the Monster Bank. That's the Bank of the United States. In 1832, the president of the Bank of the United States writes to Henry Clay. This guy's named Nicholas Biddle. And Biddle says to Clay, look, uh, the charter of the Bank of the United States, our license to do business, is going to expire in 1836. I want to renew it now. They had a 20-year charter, um, and it's going to expire in 1836, and uh, Biddle uh, wants to keep the bank in business, and he decides that um, it's better to renew it in 1832 than it is in 1836. That's the Bank of the United States' is building in Philadelphia. So Biddle writes to Clay, and uh, here's a Bank of the United States note. Um, uh, it's part of. It's actually not a uh, bank note. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a stock certificate. Um, Biddle writes to Clay, and there he is, and he says to Clay, "Look, um, you should renew our charter early uh, for." good political reasons, and here's the politics of it. The president is going to get the bill if it goes through Congress, and President Jackson has already indicated that he's against the American system, you know, by vetoing the um, uh, Maysville Road. So, Biddle says, we passed this bill and one of two things are going to happen. Jackson will either sign it, in which case it's great for the American economy and for the American system, your plan, um, or uh, he will veto it. And if he vetoes it, that gives you an issue to run against him in 1836. Jackson's against prosperity. So um, in either case, it's a win-win to do this early. Well, Jack, um, not Jackson, uh, Clay goes home and thinks about it and decides uh, Biddle's right. And he passes the bill, and they send it up to the White House, and then, not terribly unexpectedly, Jackson vetoes it. And Biddle and Clay think they've got Jackson where they want him. But it turns out they're the ones who have miscalculated because Jackson's happy to make the bank an issue in 1836, uh, 1832, and... and um, it turns out to be a winning issue for Jackson. Now, let's take a look at Biddle here again. Look at, he's got the nice suit on. He's got he's the kind of guy that wears gloves to get his uh, portrait painted. Um, Jackson bets that people don't like guys like Nicholas Biddle. Just in the same way that people get antagonistic to Wall Street billionaires today, he thinks the average voter isn't going to say, oh, Nicholas Biddle, thank you for your bank and all the prosperity you bring. He thinks people are going to say, this is a rich elitist who's trying to take over power in um, American government. So let's listen to some excerpts from Jackson's bank veto message. He gives this on July 10th, 1832, and the kind of rhetoric he uses to attack the bank. The many millions which this act proposes to bestow on the stockholders of the existing bank must come directly or indirectly out of the earnings of the American people. The bank and the bankers are going to get rich at the expense of average people. It is to be regretted, says Jackson, that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. These people have too much influence. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talent, of education, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions. In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven and the fruits of superior industry, economy, and virtue, every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, 
and the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. Many of our rich men have not been content with equal protection and equal benefits, but have sought us to make them richer by act of Congress. By attempting to gratify their desires, we have in the results of our legislation arrayed section against section, interest against interest, and man against man in a fearful commotion which threatens to shake the foundations of our union. We, means I, take a stand against all new grants of monopolies and exclusive privileges, against any prostitution of our government to the advancement of the few at the expense of the many. Very, very heated rhetoric. So Jackson vetoes the bank. He says, let's make it an issue in the election of 1832. And then he goes and wins that election. Well, now the bank's in trouble. Their charter is about to run out um, four years later, and Jackson tries to hurry the process along by withdrawing the federal government's deposits in the bank. Um, Jackson portrays the bank as a monster, calls it a monster in uh, the veto message, and um, here is a political cartoon by a Jackson supporter of the president slaying the many-headed monster. And you can see that Nicholas Biddle's head is the central one there with the top hat on. Um, here's another cartoon. Jo um, the downhill of the bank. Jackson's like Samson. He's pulled the pillars of the bank down around him. And we can see all of the fat cats running uh, with their money bags um, and their bloated salaries and there's Nicholas Biddle um, as Satan right in the center of it all it is time for me to resign my presidency says Nicholas Biddle as Jackson triumphantly destroys the bank all right Jackson destroys the bank the bank goes out of business in 1836 and then in 1837 there's uh, the first industrial depression in America, the Panic of 1837, and uh, things are very, very bad in America. The economy is in terrible shape, um, and that leads me to my last uh, discussion of the day: the question of fear in the market. Um, this is what happens in the Panic of 1837. This political cartoon of uh, a working man. He's a carpenter. You can see his tools at his feet. And he's in terrible debt, and he's about to be evicted from his house. And on the background to the right, we see two men in blue jackets and top hats. Those guys are um, the um, the uh, I forget the title, but they are they're there to evict them. They're they're the, they're people who's a professional bill collect, debt collectors and evictors. Um, and if they um, they have the authority to sell the goods of uh, somebody who can't pay their bills in, uh, uh, in order to make some of the money back. But this guy's looking in and sees there's nothing that this family owns except a few miserable tools and a piece, couple of pieces of furniture. And he says to his friend, I say, Sam, I wonder whether we are to get our costs. Well, what's the family saying? The father says, I have no money and cannot get any work. The mother says, My dear, cannot you contrive to get some food for the children? I don't care about myself. The kids say, the little girl says, uh, I might be a little boy actually in those days, Father, can I have some bread, a piece of bread? Um, and the oldest kid says, I'm so hungry. And the middle one makes a pun. I say, Father, can you get some species claws? It's, um, it's, it's a pun. It's not worth getting into. Um, so we have this miserable, star starving family. We have the working man who is desperate to work, um, uh, but he has no work at all because the economy's crashed. It leads me to this last um, 
last um, cartoon. This is a pun on on uh, Macbeth, Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and if you remember from Macbeth, uh, Bank, uh, Banquo's ghost uh, shows up um, at a crucial moment in the play, and this is uh, Banco's ghost, the ghost of banking in America. So what do we see here? We see the president dressed as an old lady, saying. Uh, about the ghost. Never mind him, gentlemen. The creature's scared and has some conscience left. But by the eternal, we must shake that out of him. And then we have the new president, uh, Martin Van Buren, saying, He's scared of the ghost. Never shake thy gray locks at me. Thou canst not say I did it. The ghost himself says, I am the ghost of commerce. And on the left, we have Andrew Jackson's idiot supporters saying, Down with the bank. Um, drinking uh, and no credit, huzzah! Um, their political support of Jackson's boneheaded industrial policy and bank uh, monetary policy has destroyed, according to this cartoon, the economy of the United States. Um, uh, whether you believe that or not, the arguments about the economy have become center stage in American politics um, by the 1830s and we're still having uh, these same arguments okay um, that's it for today and I'll be talking to you soon cartoon the times Things are going to hell in America in the 1830s. We see drunkenness, we see debt, um, we see disaster, um, we see um, uh, unemployed sailors and working men again. Things have gone terribly wrong. And this is what I mean, meant when I said before about fear in the market. I mentioned this with farmers. You take a risk if you specialize on your farm that you're going to lose your crop or the price will fall, that something go bad, will go bad. When you engage in the market, you also engage in risky behavior because you're not engaging in safety first anymore. Well, what applies to farmers applies even more to sailors and working men and, and uh, uh, bankers. Anybody engaged in commerce in the city, business owners, you can lose everything. When the economy crashes, and this is something in 2011 uh, uh, people have uh, learned again, when the economy crashes, um, then uh, it can destroy lives. And that